Today is the first Sunday in Advent, and uh, we're excited. We're ex- I've, I've, so if, if you're like me, I grew up sheltered. I was sheltered in the, in the, the, white, the white walls and stained glass windows of an independent fundamental Baptist church, and I never heard the word Advent. We were protected from things like that. I later realized that Advent was something that the church down the street was doing every Christmas time, but, but we were protected. We were sheltered from that. Sheltered safe in the arms of God. It wasn't until I was in the army and I was working in the, as a chaplain's assistant, of all things, in, in the community chapel in Berlin, Germany, where they had five church services every Sunday two Catholic Masses, the Protestant Mass, the Pentecostal Mass, and then in the afternoon, the Korean-speaking congregation. And uh, uh, we took turns, the chaplain's assistants in the chapel took turns working on Sundays, and if it was your turn to work on Sunday, you worked for all five of those services and set things up different. You know, the the Catholic Church, they they have the cross with the crucifix on it, but we were clever. We had we had a reversible cross. So after the, after the mass, I would one of my things was to go out and turn the cross around for the Protestants. You get the you get the idea, right? And uh, at Christmas time, they 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 brought out this this special candlestick that had five candle holders on it, and. Uh, we, we kept it in a storeroom all winter, all, all the rest of the year. We brought it out. We put these five candles in it, three purple, one pink, and a white one in the middle. And I said, what, it, what in the world is this? I've been around church all my life, and I've never seen this piece of equipment before. And it was explained to me, that's the Advent wreath. And I said, what's Advent? So uh, I'm, da- I'm now catching, catching you up to where you might be this morning. If you're here this morning and you, like me, were sheltered from this your whole life, uh, we're now at the, same, at the same point. What's Advent? So uh, I looked it up in the dictionary. Advent defined is the beginning of an event, the invention of something, or the arrival of a person. Does that sound familiar to you? So that's the general definition of the word Advent, but when we apply it in the context of the Christian calendar, this is what we're talking about. Advent is the period of preparation for the celebration of the birth of Jesus Christ at Christmas, and also it serves a dual function because we're thrifty in the church. We also want to use this as a way of looking forward to the promised second coming of Christ. So the season of Advent is a season of preparation. And uh, often it includes a time of reflection. Maybe there's some time for repentance. There's some time for sober thinking. Am I ready? Am I ready for God to enter into my life? That's kind of a funny question because it supposes that God has now already entered into my life. But have you ever tried to just keep him out? I mean, we say we do. You, you, know, you know, we have not shut God out of schools. We have not. We say we have. But can you, you know, is, is, there, a, is there a lock that is God-proof? We say we can't pray. I pray. I don't always pray out loud. I don't always pray up front. I don't always say, now bow your heads with me and close your eyes. Close your eyes and repeat after me, our Father. I don't, that, that's one way we pray. But nobody can tell you you can't pray. I mean, they could tell you. you could, they could say those words. But do those words have any power? Is there a pro, prohibition against talking to God that can stick? No. So it's, it's a silly thing that we say that we imagine that there's a time that God is not already present. 
However, what we're talking about here is the, the let's see, Carmen, the singer Carmen, now with the Lord, had a, had a, a music tour he called Riot, Righteous Invasion of Truth. Some of you will remember that, Righteous Invasion of Truth. Well, and I know, I know Pastor Ben loves this, that the, the birth of Jesus Christ in, in, the, in the manger in Bethlehem, that was, that was God's righteous invasion. When, when, when God came in flesh. And that's what the season of Advent is about. He's already come, and we know that. But this is, this is our anniversary celebration, right? Uh, Pastor Jose and his wife just celebrated, I think, 21 years of marriage. I, 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 know, I noticed this because they posted something on Facebook about it. Uh, we celebrate anniversaries, right? So think of, think of Christmas, think of Advent as the celebration of an anniversary of the most important event in human history. And yes, we're going to celebrate it. Yes, we're going to make a big deal of it. And we ought to, because it changes everything. So this season of Advent, which we begin this morning, uh, is, is all about a reminder that God has done something extraordinary and has promised to do something else extraordinary. And that this extraordinary thing that God has done has an impact on you personally. And as Pastor Tim said earlier, if, if it hasn't meant anything to you up until now, maybe this season is the season where it's going to become personal for you. Because we celebrate God entering human history he didn't just do that for fun, as we're going to be talking about over the next four weeks, and uh, finishing up uh, on Sunday, December the 24th at 5 p.m., the, the vote is in, the people have spoken, 5 p.m., Sunday evening, December 24th, our Christmas Eve candlelight service. From now until then, we are celebrating in anticipation God has done great things. Great and mighty is His name. Okay. It was a dark time. In the progress of the history of of the human race on the planet Earth, it was a dark time. The story of God's unfolding work of redemption still ongoing, still in process, and at times things have been good. But now, not good. What time am I describing? Could be any time. It could be this time. Things have been good for many of us right now. Right now, right now, things are not good. By some measurements, things have never been as good as they are right now. By, by some measurement. But if you take another measure, you can also make a case things have never been as bad as they are right now. This is the theme verse for the season of Advent, Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 2. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shone. 
This last week, I came across a, a statistic. In the United States of America last year, we set a record. Yay us. Are you interested to know what record we set? Last year, 2022, more people in this last year just ended, more people ended their own lives by suicide than at any other time in our history. Almost 50,000 Americans of all ages decided that their life meant so little to them that it would be better for them not to be alive. That's a grim statistic. But things are so much better now. We're, we've never been more connected than we are right now. We're connected... At anybody who has a smartphone in your hand, hold it up. You're holding it in your hand right now. You're connected to the world. Do you feel connected? It's funny because at the same time that we're more connected than we've ever been, for many people, we feel more lonely than we've ever felt before. We feel more alone. We feel more desperation. We feel less hope. Kelly, this week, talking about this, said, Dennis, don't, don't, don't miss talking about this. It's a great opportunity to talk about this. Mental health. Almost 50,000 of us last year ended our lives by our own hand. In many cases, because of untreated, undiagnosed, ignored, suppressed mental health issues. There's a stigma of shame and guilt. We don't talk about depression. We don't talk about other mental health issues. When we do, we talk about them in hushed tones. We share them in those secret prayer requests. We don't post on Facebook about them. There's shame and there's, there's guilt about them. But I want you to know that God cares about you and He cares about the person near you who is affected by some mental health issue. And that person, and it might even be a person in the room today, that person needs to be reminded, God sees you, God knows you, God loves you. And you are not alone, and you are not without help, and you are not without hope. And here at Harmony, here at Harmony, we're, we're, I, I, I'm unashamedly stealing the slogan from Planet Fitness. This is a no-judgment zone. Will you buy into that with me? Will you raise your right hand and solemnly swear, I promise not to judge. I promise not to judge somebody who walks through this door because there's a cross on the steeple and maybe there's somebody here who can tell me how to find some hope. we were introduced to a, a relatively new gospel, kind of bluegrass singing group, a father and two sons called The Sound. And they recorded a song, Welcome to the First Church of Mercy. Come on in here and find a seat. There's grace here. People are walking in darkness. And they need to see some light. And God has put light here. Let's let the light shine. This is part of what Advent is about. This season of Advent, leading up to the celebration of Christmas, it's all about restoring, it's about reawakening our hope that things as bad as they are right now are not going to stay this way. Things are going to be better. 
Now, I'm not telling you, like some will tell you, that if you, if you pray hard enough, if you trust hard enough, if you give enough, you'll get things better right now the way you want them to be. No. That's not the promise. The promise is, there is a better home awaiting in the sweet by and by. You don't have to give up hope because there is good reason to continue to hope. God has not left us alone. He has not left us on our own. He is not a God who says, you, make your, you made your bed, now you lie in it. Because a lot of us have made messy beds. This is the first Sunday of Advent. We're going to be following uh, through this month a, a series of studies in the Psalms. It's kind of a continuation of our Psalms for the Summer series. This is a series of Psalms for Advent, the Songs of Hope and Anticipation. And my assignment this morning is to begin in Psalm 80 with the expectation of restoration. If you're familiar with the Advent custom, if we had an Advent wreath here this morning, we would light the first candle in the Advent wreath. <clears throat> Just the beginning of a growing sense of light. And as I read through Psalm 80 in preparation for this morning's message, I, I discovered there are three moments, three moments that the psalm writer is describing. The psalm writer is Asaph, a musician and writer appointed by King David. Uh, so if the sons of Korah that we talked about this summer, they, they were sort of like the casting crowns of David's time. So Asaph is kind of the Michael W. Smith, all right? Asaph wrote 12 of the psalms that we have in the book of Psalms. <clears throat> and many of his psalms are celebratory, but this psalm... The, the, the 80th Psalm was written on the occasion of what appears to be a military defeat, something that was unusual during the time of King David because uh, uh, he was a man after God's own heart and, and like we sang this morning, uh, he fought on his knees. And God was giving him victory after victory after victory. But on this occasion, they had suffered a defeat. The notation at the beginning of Psalm 80 says, to the choir master, here are some instructions. When you perform this song in worship, here's how you're supposed to do it. According to Lilies, according to Lilies, we think is the name of the tune. And, uh, and then he says, it's a testimony of Asaph, a psalm. And the, here's the first of the three moments that uh, he describes as I see it. The first moment is how it is right now. And how it is right now is this. <laughs> Tell me if this doesn't describe your moment. We need God's help. Something had occurred. Or a number of things have occurred in a series. Kelly and I uh, are, are following the story of a young couple that we know. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we heard about a terrible accident. A young man uh, was splitting wood with a log splitter, somehow got his, his wrist in the path of that hydraulic ram, and his hand was severed. He was taken to the hospital, and I think 12-hour surgery, they were able to reattach his hand. It's a young couple that we happen to know. They're, they're, um, the wife is the sister of one of our, well, all three of our sons, one of their good friends, right, right here in our area. This week we found out that the, the barn, the garage, the woodshed where the accident happened caught on fire and they lost the barn. And we're thinking, how much more can one family ha handle? That's not a 
an intentional play on words, by the way. Sometimes it's one thing, a terrible big thing. Sometimes it's a series of little things or even a series of big terrible things. Have you been there? Do you find yourself in the middle of one of those right now? Something has occurred or a number of things that have occurred that wake us up and again to the reality of how small and how powerless we are. Are we there yet? And this, when we realize how small and powerless we are, this ought to and usually does remind us that while I am small and powerless, I know someone who is neither small nor powerless. I know the infinite God, the maker of heaven and earth, and there is nothing he cannot do. Are you with me? Are you there yet? So that's where this psalm comes from. It begins in verse 1. Of, of course it begins in verse 1, Dennis. What are you doing? You don't have to say that. <laughs> it begins with some words of praise and worship. This is how we ought to begin every prayer. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who are enthroned upon the cherubim, shine forth. Sort of sounds like, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Let's start out by acknowledging you are God and you are great. But then let's get to the point, verse 2. Before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh stir up your might and come to save us. Let's get right to it. Come to save us. um, The... One of the most important and effective and instructional prayers recorded in the Bible comes from the mouth of the disciple Peter. On the occasion of him climbing out of the boat and getting on the water to walk to Jesus. You remember the story? Jesus comes walking on the water. Peter says, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come and walk on the water to you. And Jesus says, come ahead. And he does took a lot of courage. The story says, you know the story. The wind was blowing and the waves were raging and Peter got distracted. He took took his eyes off of Jesus and the scripture says, and he began to sink. Now, do you know the physics of sinking? In my experience, no sooner do I begin to sink than I have sunk. It's, it's really hard to measure the time that elapsed between the time I began to sink and the time I bottomed out, okay? You, you with me? Now maybe, maybe Peter was sinking slowly, but it doesn't matter. And in that moment, in that instant, as Peter was beginning to sink, he prayed, Our Father who art in heaven. No, he skipped all of that. Do you know what he prayed? Help! Literally. I'm not making this up. Help! And do you know, his prayer was answered immediately. That's a good example of a prayer. He wa- was Peter where God wanted him to be? Yes, he was. He, he was where God wanted him to be because... He asked God for guidance, and God gave it to him. Step out. Was Peter doing what what God wanted him to do? Mm, Yes and no. He had gotten distracted. Has that happened to you? You're where God wants you to be. You're doing what God wants you to do. But you look around, and you say, whoa, look what I'm doing. Or, whoa, look what they're doing. And in that instant, you and I, we get refocused and we pray, God, help! And God helps. Hallelujah. He goes on, and and this this life, if you have your Bible open, maybe highlight this, this, this verse 3. Restore us, O God, 
Let your face shine that we may be saved. How it is right now, God, we know you've been displeased with us. I acknowledge that often the trouble I find myself in is trouble of my own making. Are you there? I've made some bad choices. I made some choices without asking for guidance from God or from my wife or from all the other people that God has put in my life to help me find wisdom. In a multitude of counselors, there is wisdom. The wisest man who ever lived wrote that. The wisest man who ever lived said, I need to gather wisdom from other people. If the wisest man who ever lived understood that, so should I. Before I jump and make a huge decision that has the potential for disaster, I ought to get some advice from some other people, especially from those people who will be jumping with me. Maybe uh, I miscalculated, but I made a bad choice and I acted without thinking. Certainly I acted without praying. And now here I am. God, we know you've been displeased with us, but will you, al- will you always be angry with us from now on? God does not ever tell us, I'm finished with you. Verse 4, O Lord God of hosts, how long will you be angry with your people's prayers? God, I'm sorry for the thing or for the things I've done that has landed me in this place of darkness. But please don't turn your face away from me. Asaph goes on, you have fed them with the bread of tears and given them tears to drink in full measure. Yes, God, I'm feeling the weight of my mistake. It's with me all the time. You make us an object of contention for our neighbors, and our enemies laugh among themselves. We Christians, we we Christians were being mocked and ridiculed because we, we talk a good game, but we behave so poorly in public. So that people around us say, You call that being a Christian? I want nothing to do with that. And so we come to this line again in verse 7. Restore us, O God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. God had told Aaron, the first high priest, Aaron, when you have come in to offer sacrifices to me, and the people are waiting outside to find out, has God accepted the sacrifice offered for our sin? When you go out and speak to the people, you say this to them. You put my name on them. Aaron, go tell the people, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you (laughs) and be gracious unto you. God told Aaron, tell the people, God is making His face shine on you. God is pleased with you. God is smiling. And so Asaph is calling out to God, God, Make your face shine on us again that we may feel your pleasure, that we may be promised your salvation. That's how it is right now. Then Asaph talks about how it used to be. God has done so much for us in the past. This is a good, it's a good exercise for us In fact, we probably just did something like this during the Thanksgiving season. Think about how good God has been to us. What God has done for me already. None of which I deserve. Be reminded of what God has done for us in the past. And and Asaph picks up this idea. He, He chooses the image of a vine. 
You brought a vine out of Egypt. Verse 8. You, you took us out of bondage in Egypt. We are the vine in your hand. You have taken us out of Egypt. You drove out the nations in the promised land, Canaan, and planted the vine there. I wonder if Jesus was thinking about Psalm 80 centuries later when he said to his disciples, as recorded in John 15, I am the vine and you are the branches. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. Ooh. Everybody gets, everybody gets some treatment from the, from the God who tends his vine. Everybody gets some treatment. Some get the whole branch cut off. And even those who are doing well get clipped. Yes? Have you been clipped? Doesn't mean God doesn't love you. It means God is working to make you as fruitful as you can be. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. He says again, I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For, listen to this part, apart from me you can do nothing. Asaph takes this idea of the vine. He says in verse 9, you cleared ground for it. You drove, out the, you drove out the inhabitants of Canaan. You cleared the land and you, and you planted that vine. It took deep root and it filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shade, the mighty cedars with its... This vine, this, this work of God in his people, it gives shade to the mountains. That's a big vine. It causes the mighty cedars of Lebanon to be sheltered under the vine's branches. Imagine that vine. Hope it's not poison ivy. It sent out its branches to the sea, the Mediterranean Sea on the west, and it shoots to the river, the boundary on the east, the Euphrates. He's describing the work of God in the land of promise that he gave to his people Israel. That's how it used to be. God has done so much for us in the past, but it seems like it seems like God maybe has turned his back on us because he continues in verse 12. Why then have you broken down its walls so that all who pass along the way pluck its fruit? The boar from the forest ravages it. All that, all that move on the field feed on it. This vine, this mighty vine, God, this work that you've done, it's become easy pickings to everybody who passes by. So verse 14, turn again, O God of hosts, look down from heaven and see, have regard for this vine, that the stock that your right hand planted, and for the son whom you made strong for yourself. They, our enemies, have burned it with fire, they have cut it down, may they perish at the rebuke of your face. God, help us. Deliver us from our enemies. Restore us to the place of your blessing. And that brings us in Psalm 80 to the, to the third moment, how it will be soon. How it is right now? <laughs> Dark. But there is a promise. Light is coming. John chapter 1 and verse 4. In him, the word Jesus was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Verse 9 of John 1. The true light, that, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. This is the message of Advent. Light is coming. And so how it will be soon, the psalm writer sees a glimmer of hope 
in our darkness. Verse 17, let your hand be on the man of your right hand, the son of man, the son of man. Does that sound somewhat familiar to you? The son of man whom you have made strong for yourself. Now, ad admittedly, this is a very careful reference to God's promise of a deliverer. It's not, it's not as obvious as some of us would like it to be. The Messiah is coming. Hold on. It's a, it's a subtle promise, but it's a promise nonetheless. A deliverer, one who would come from the tribe of Judah, even from the very line of David. So how it will be soon, there is a glimmer of hope, and the Son of Man is coming, and you will restore us, and you will save us. Verse 18 of Psalm 80. Then we shall not turn back from you, Give us life, and we will call upon your name. And one last time at the end of Psalm 80, this line, this repeated refrain, this chorus is mentioned again. Restore us, O Lord God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. I'm sure that uh, through the years, this psalm has been set to music any number of times. But most recently, one of our modern-day Asaphs, Michael W. Smith, took this line and he composed a song around it. And after, after the worship team comes up and leads us in our last song, and after the benediction is spoken... Ryan is going to play uh, um, that song uh, through our system so that you, if, if you just linger for a minute, I think the words will be on the screen and the music will be playing. Uh, Lord, let your light shine on us so that we can have our way lit through the darkest night so that we may be saved. God has brought his light and dispelled our darkness. And he does it over and over and over again. Look for the light in your place of darkness. Look for the hope in your feeling of hopelessness. Look for the help where you feel most helpless. God is coming to you. In fact, has already come. Let's pray together. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this encouragement from your word. Yes, our days have been dark and our situations have been difficult. And there have been times when we have felt hope wavering. And there have been times when we've begun to wonder if there is any help coming for us. And I thank you, God, that you are faithful to your promise, that you will not let us go unaided. You will not abandon us. You who have begun a good work in us will be faithful to complete it, even to the day of redemption. And I pray, Father, today, if there is even one person in this room who came here with a feeling of hopelessness, the feeling of loneliness. I pray that that person has heard today from you directly. You might have used my voice, but you were the one speaking into that person's heart, into their thoughts. I see you. I know you. I love you. Turn to me and receive all I have for you. May we do that today in Jesus' name. You guys stand with us as we do our last song. Sorry, audible. Before she starts, it goes along with your thing. If you're the person that is helping someone who feels hopeless, you're going to feel hopeless yourself. So call on God yourself and have the strength to do it.
because some people that come in here with hopelessness that are in those mindsets of suicide, they don't know what they're doing. And they get stuck in kind of like this hamster wheel and nothing you say is gonna get through to them. But you need the strength to carry on, to continue to push through and to pursue. So pursue God yourself as you do that because you're gonna need him.
My chains are gone. I've been set free. Those chains are those things that bind us. And they hold us down. And we struggle with those for so long. And all we need to do is look to you. My God, my Savior rescued me. And because he did, my chains are gone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this season that we can celebrate your invasion into this earth to do battle for us. And God, we are looking forward to you coming again. We love you. We thank you. God, we give you all the praise and glory. And we ask this in Jesus' name.